today changes my whole entire life. Welcome to Gritability, a podcast about the power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds to attain the life of your dreams. I'm your podcast host, Adam Clausen. With me is the beautiful and ever radiant Ro Clausen. Yay, I am so excited for this episode. First of all, we have the most amazing guest. And second of all, she's our first female guest, right? In the studio? Really? I think so. What? Yeah. And I told Adam Perfect. on the way here, I'm like, all right, listen, you do the intro. I'm just going to say a couple things about Courtney and then I'll throw it back to you. And then as I start talking, he's like, oh no, you're doing the intro. <laughs> <laughs> so power. I stole some stuff out of Wikipedia and I'm going to cheat and read it. But first of all, I want to say this. I'm going to try not to cry oh. because we were talking about hormones right before we started. And I'm in this awful hormonal phase right yeah. now. So I thought I was the queen of like women's empowerment. I started this nonprofit to help women feel confident when their loved ones are away in prison, yeah. right? So I'm like, I got this on lock. Then I met Courtney, <laughs> Courtney Olson, by the way, who like, you know, you, you know how sometimes you teach what you need to learn. And yeah. so I had a baby and my body looks different and hormones and all of this stuff. And sometimes I have these days where I'm like, oh, I'm not good enough. And, you know, I don't have to go down that road. But I go on social media and I see Courtney's posts and I'm like, I could do this, right? Like, I'm the girl who I worked at a company for 15 years and I never wore a skirt unless it was maxi because I hated my thick legs. Worked out at CrossFit for easily seven years, did not wear a pair of shorts. I say you didn't wear shorts, did I you? never wore shorts to the, the point where I lived in New Jersey, right? And I would pack my clothes before I went and I accidentally grabbed a pair of those leggings that keep you warm in the winter. Yeah. It's July and I had sunburn. And somebody offered to lend me a pair of shorts and I wouldn't wear them, right? So Courtney's made me feel so confident, right? When I see your posts and I read them and I feel them with my whole heart and soul. Aww. And then on the other end, right? The first time I met you, you're like, I'm going to teach you how to choke out Adam with your <laughs> legs. <laughs> and I'm like, I love this girl. So we're going to go, we're going to talk about all of this and how you became this amazing rock star, right? We're going to girl crush and yeah. girl crush. There's a pun. G-R-R-L crush. We'll get there. But okay. So you started competitive bodybuilding in 2011, mm -hmm. right? And then this is the coolest one. You went to Australia and became their first female ever female arm wrestling champion uh -huh. in 2012. Freaking amazing. Um, and then you've been the subject of many TV documentaries that showed your strength. And this was my favorite, including Stan Lee's Superhuman Season 3 High Voltage, where scientists claimed <laughs> I love this, <laughs> that you had the strongest thighs on the planet. The deadliest. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Wikipedia fixed that. Those deadliest <laughs> is better. You're a founder of Camp Confidence. Mm -hmm which is a camp which empowers, encourages, and improves young girls and women's well-being. In March of 2020, you were, featured, you were a featured guest in the fourth episode of Former Congresswoman, where she talked about her long battle with, you talked about your long battle with alcohol, alcoholism and drugs. I can't wait to unpack all of this. Yeah. Who was the Congresswoman? Because it cut off. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Got it. Okay. Mm, yeah. And then her. January 21, you published your memoir titled Crushing It. <laughs> How I crushed diet culture, addiction, and the patriarch. Oh my god! I can't which, imagine. which, just to interject oh, here, I'm so mad. It's supposed to be right there on the top yes, shelf. Yes, it is. Oh, how cute! But someone left it on her bookshelf. Somebody, <laughs> because it literally sits on my nightstand next oh. to my bed. Yep. Oh. And then also, you're the founder and CEO of Girl Clothing, spelled G R R L. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it opened in 2015. What I love about it is the sizing, the very unique sizing, and it's all inclusive. So yeah. let's unpack. Where I think I want to start is you are this pillar of self-confidence and you exude all of this amazing female empowerment. You help other people find their own confidence. But from your story, it didn't start there. Right. Yeah. So let's start from the beginning. Like did it start when when did it start 
when did it start? That's a good question. <sighs> you know, I would say it probably started in the womb. You know, wow. the more I learn about this, the subconscious and how we're creating beliefs from the womb, you know, uh, it leads me to believe that that's when this stuff started happening. You know, I'm, I don't have doctorate or scientist in my bio, unfortunately, because, you know, I did a couple years of college and I was like, screw that. It's not for me. Oh, and by the way, do we cuss? We cuss as much okay. as we want. We're authentic. <laughs> Speak freely. <laughs> All <That's> right. right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I was born breech, so maybe it started then thinking I was special and different. I don't know. But as far as, you know, the, the, the troubles, because you don't realize until you're older that, you know, ages zero to eight years old, some say seven, some, some, you know, medical professionals and scientists and quantum physicists and stuff say seven, but ages zero to eight years old, we're not fully conscious. So, you know, everything is either good or bad, right or wrong. We see everything in black and white. There's no gray area. So we create a majority of our beliefs about ourselves and a majority of those beliefs are negative. And I'll give you an example. So let's say, do either one of you have a younger sibling? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, how much younger? I'm one of six. I'm number two. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. uh, you're one of two. So uh, the oldest then would have been how old? What's the age difference? So there's three years between us. Okay, perfect. Yep. So, and what's their name? Christina. So Christina is older. Yep. Okay. So you're one, Christina's four. Christina's sitting on the floor trying to tie her shoe and do the whole rabbit runs around the tree and through the thing, right? Remember that? Yep. And she can't get it. And she looks up, was your mom around growing up? Mm -hmm. Okay, she looks up at your mom, say your mom's in the kitchen cutting up an apple. And you say, and Christina says, mom, help, I can't tie my shoe. And she looks at Christina and then she looks over at you and you are in your high chair standing up, wobbling around, about to fall out face forward. And she says, hold on, Christina, I'll be right there. She runs over to you and grabs you and gets you situated and put back in your chair. What's the belief that Christina just created about herself? Wow, well, I have chills. I have chills. Right. And what's so malicious about that is Christina has no clue she's created this belief. Your mom has no clue she's created this belief. And is it true? No. Your mom just didn't want an enormous hospital bill or potentially you know <laughs> deal with your sister <laughs> or i mean yourself falling out and cracking your head open sure. and dying so she's just being a parent but christina now has this belief that you are more important mom loves you more and so for whatever reason you all grow up and you get together at christmas and you just want to you know like she just wants to punch you in the mouth or do you know what i mean like there might be some beef there or let's say you know you're teaching your son to ride his bike and you take the training wheels off let's say a couple years down the road because it's what two mm -hmm. yeah i'm not very good at math so <laughs> i think it's been about two years it's been a time warp the last four years but you take the training wheels off and you let them go and you stand there and you watch and you're like awesome amazing and he looks behind him and you're not there my dad abandoned me it's the most outlandish silly sure. thing but because we don't have that ability to see things in gray everything is black and white we create these limiting beliefs about ourselves and they go into our subconscious and our subconscious mind is 40 million times more powerful than our conscious mind. And that's where all of our programming lives, like blinking your eyes and our heart beating, but then also the programming, right? And, sure. and so growing up, my mom is an alcoholic and, you know, we back then we have no education really around what is alcoholism and addiction and you know, is it learned behavior and genetic? And we just thought she was a bad person that needed to get good, not a sick person that needed to get well. Cause she was, she was a hot mess. And I, you know, just f feared, feared her. She was, you know, I wouldn't say violent, but very aggressive. And, and I'll point this out in case she comes across it on the internet. Cause sometimes, you know, she, she randomly shows up and is like, we're, we're good friends today. But that being said, you know, it wasn't the case for a long time. So long story short, you know, my parents divorced, like most kids at you know, eight or so, went to a new school and, you know, starting to become aware of my body and having these bigger legs. I remember I used to blow the crotch out in my tights, like in kindergarten. My mom would get so pissed off at me and 
my parents worked out of town and so I'd often stay with like cousins or even though they weren't cousins, right? Everyone's your cousin growing up. <laughs> You're like, oh, we're not actually related by the time mm-hmm. you turn 15. So, uh, yeah, I, I would stay over and grew up in Garberville, California, where we were in the mud, in the river, in the trees, needing changes of clothes all the time. And I could never fit into my friends slash cousins clothing, boys, girls, not even like the uncle, like my legs were too big. And so (laughs) that gave me, you know, huge insecurities. And by the time I got to junior high, um, you know, I've been severely bullied like most kids in the fifth, sixth grade, because that's kind of like when a lot of this stuff happens and no sense of, you know, assertiveness or self-worth or you don't realize the impact of growing up with a parent who's an alcoholic has. And it's so cool to see you two so present in your child's life because what we have today is this epidemic where everybody is on their phone and it is just as bad as alcoholism because you're not present as a parent. Mm -hmm. And this child is creating the same beliefs. Like I sit and observe so many parents like just on their phone scrolling stuff and the kids playing, but meanwhile, you know, trying to get their attention and they're like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, you know, not really there and not really present. And it has the same impact and they're sitting there creating those same beliefs. So, you know, what you're doing and, and being role models and, showing that you are present and observing is so powerful. So by growing up, you know, it's not like I had, she wasn't dragging me around from trap house to, you know, living, squatting in places that didn't have electricity or, you know what I mean? I always had food to eat and, but it was just very unstable, you know, and, and like what was going to happen next and she driving drunk and would fight with my dad and always take me with her is, you know, come on, Courtney, we're going. And, and so anyway, by the time, you know, I got to junior high, that manifested into counting calories. And prior to that, I actually in went... In junior high? Yeah, in junior high. So it would have been 11 because I started, I'm a November baby. Wow. So yeah, so so started school like four. So it was about 11. And then prior to that, you know, when my parents divorced and we don't realize like how much of an impact that has on us as kids, we, we blame ourselves, you know, and of course back in the... 80s late 80s it's like there's no sit down and have a come to jesus moment and talk to your kids like they're you know small young adults and say hey look so things don't get discussed and you know i go off with my mom who's still sick with her alcoholism and again no clue what alcoholism is still at this point i just think she's a bad person and um so by this point, though, when I got to junior high, I actually moved in with my dad and he remarried. So, you know, new siblings in the picture and that's a whole nother story. And um, but yeah, prior to that and changing schools and everything and getting bullied. Uh, and then we had a massive earthquake. It was uh, like a six point nine earthquake up in northern California and caused a, a bunch of damage. And it was like at three o'clock in the morning. And this is why I had like bottle coke bottle glasses i was so blind as a kid you know just this chubby like coke bottle glasses. <laughs> like not, not adorable now <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> nothing like seeing me get knocked out on slap fighting with a blonde mohawk doing a fort somersault <laughs> you know what i mean so just this little pushover you know didn't want to rock the boat little girl and um anyway waking up at three o'clock in the morning and it was i was staying at my brother's friend's house who had a water bed so i was in a strange place couldn't find my glasses and it was a I'm still to this day I'm terrified of earthquakes <laughs> and so that caused some type of anxiety because it was coupled with starting a new school and uh, them getting a divorce and living with an alcoholic and I started this tick of blinking really hard like this and today you know you think about my gosh instantly I would have been put on something yeah whether it be Xanax or sure. you know an antidepressant and fortunately grew out of that but then it it morphed into counting calories right because as an addict we look for something to control and so that then turned into my body image because how did, I, just just a quick question yeah how did how did you even know about counting calories at that age I, that's a really good question i i think it's just you know diet culture has been so pervasive through forever and i well, now that you say it, and I think about it for more than two seconds, my mom, 
like, you know, growing up, she was on every diet, right? Okay. Remember back in the 80s, there was, oh my gosh, the Hollywood diet, the cabbage soup diet, the Atkins, you know, and, and then we moved into fat free and low carb and oh, there's just always something. So, and, and plus she had Lyme's disease for a number of years and the doctors kept telling her it was stress. So she lost a bunch of hair. So she had a ton of insecurities Oof. herself. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just sit and watch her in the mirror pick herself apart. And, you know, mm. nothing was ever good enough. And, you know, as children, again, from ages zero to seven or zero to eight, we're sponges and we absorb all of the programming from our parents. That's why we have this generational trauma and we just walk straight into their shoes, you know. And even though she terrified the shit out of me, because by the time I got to um, high school, she had ended up moving down the street from where my dad lived and I'd go down and see her and she was really sick with alcoholism at this point where I'd walk in the door and she'd be like throwing shit at me like get out of here you I don't know who you are and I'm like 13 years old like ah. and mm -hmm. at any rate so <clears throat> the body image stuff that's what I thought was the problem mm -hmm. you know not addressing childhood trauma and that word is so loaded you know what I mean? It's like we hear the word trauma and it's like, oh, you know, and then, of course, to like I said, a, what degree? Because we all experiencing we all experience some form of trauma one way mm -hmm. or another. Right. And it impacts us in different ways. And that's what I love about you, too, is that you're talking about resilience and, and how to work through that. And it doesn't matter, you know, how severe it is on the scale. It, if it's had an impact on you, it's had an impact, period. And it need to address it and work through it and not stick something in your mouth, right? So, because that was my solution, was either sticking my finger down my throat and then eventually became a methamphetamine pipe, alcohol, dicks, gossip, anything I could put in my mouth to change the way that I felt about my body was my exit, you know? Mm. So, yeah, I got, got to high school and I still w was set, set out to be the first female president of the United States. So, yeah. But I will settle for being your first female guest. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I got, got to high school and, you know, went through bulimia, anorexia. And then my senior year, my stepsister started using meth. And um, I went with her to a party and was introduced to it. And then it was like I found the Holy Grail. You know, it's like, whoa, I was super productive. And at this point, my senior year, I was like the school president and nobody figured Wait it out. Bit. Time out. Time out. How did you go from the chubby little girl with the Coke bottle glasses and the tick <laughs> to the class president? <laughs> On yeah. meth. <laughs> right? Amazing. Like, yeah, like, right. The meth came after the fact, but I it was very outgoing, you know, because on the outside well put together and was very still charismatic but i was a people pleaser as well okay. i was looking for validation through everybody and again because growing up i didn't get that attention so i would you know constantly be looking for validation through other people or adults and that often turned into flirting with my male teachers as well in realizing that i had this charisma and not knowing how to use it properly you know i i uh, there were a lot of teachers at a private Catholic high school who should have been fired <laughs> in hindsight. I was going to say this just about turned into uh, what are one of those <laughs> one of those shows, the uh, documentaries on. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, I did go to a private Catholic high school as well. And this high school was caught up with, you know, these dioceses that actually got um, in quite a bit of trouble in Northern California and the archbishop got fired and like all sorts of wow. stuff went down. Yeah. So we're, we're both products of those same type schools. Yeah. So we know exactly you get what it. you're talking about. We're recovering Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> that part. <laughs> Care, careful. If my mom hears that, you oh, know, yeah. <laughs> canceled. <Yep. laughs> no Christmas for you. Right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, you know, got to, uh, my senior year, and then, you know, at the time, again, I was like, uh, started the first girls golf team, captain of the cheerleading team. Um, that's, was, that's what I was looking for. Yeah. I had a feeling there was more there because it, you're someone who just has this energy about you. Yeah. And it's, it's been my experience, and we've talked about this often, so many of, of the people that we come in contact with now 
who are successful, who've gone through some crazy stuff in their past, like there's signs. There were signs early on that you had something, you had a gift, you had this different, this strength, this energy about you. And what I'm hearing now is that it started to manifest itself. And although you didn't have the means to, to deal with the trauma, it was there. Like other people were noticing it. Like you don't become the, the class president, you know, the, the cheerleader, the captain, all of these other things without having something, some sort of gift. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, I was always in like in a leadership position externally. And then internally when I was by myself, you know, it was always like that inner dialogue of you fat piece of shit and mm. the the level of body dysmorphia, you know, eating something and then looking in the mirror and physically being able to see where you thought you gained weight. And, you know, something changed in your body. And it's like, well, actually that's scientifically impossible. Yeah. You know, you just ate a, a fucking cookie last night. It's fine. Take a breath. But you get so hyper focused on it and you don't have anybody to talk to about it. And, you know, that's when things go south is when you're head, in your head by yourself. Right. That's why community is so important and having podcasts like this and bringing awareness to these types of things, because otherwise people, you know, don't put two and two together. So, yeah, there was a lot of, you know, it was very outgoing. But what often is happening on the inside is a different story, because a lot of times, you know, when jumping forward to camp confidence, when I decided to start that which is a whole story in and on its own hopefully we get time to go there but you know i get parents who say oh my jessica's you know she's captain of the debate team and a 4.0 gpa and she's doing great i'm like yeah well let me tell you a story mm -hmm. you know you, you really can't tell what's going on and, and so often with girls and boys have body dysmorphia as well and Same mad thing. body image issues yep. yeah because and the the screwed up thing of course is that you aren't allowed I mean, of course, of course you're allowed, but you weren't encouraged or embraced to talk about it because then you're a little bitch, you're a crybaby, yep. you know, get over yourself, the fuck is wrong with you, right? Man up, yep. step outside this box, you're a little bitch, you know? So, um, but yeah, I uh, had all these things going for me and um, was even in a Christian rock band, me and Jesus Christ were tight. <laughs> and I was like baptized for the really? first time when I was 15. Yeah, I had a spiritual experience in this youth group and it was it was fascinating and to to go from that to this incredibly other path it's like wow how, how did that happen you know so i did it i did meth for all of my senior year and finally a teacher caught on and he pulled me aside and he's like okay you're either drinking you have a drinking problem or it's methamphetamines which is it and he was probably like one of the younger teachers and he was hot <laughs> so i was like hey it's meth and you know kind of freaked out and they're like well do you want to tell your parents or do you want to see a drug counselor of course, I'm going to see a drug counselor. When saw the drug counselor, he said, well, why'd you do it? And I said, because I thought I was fat and, and you know, I, I wanted to lose weight. And he said, okay, I have the perfect solution. We've got uh, this guy who's a former Golden Gloves champion, ex-heroin addict, and he's married to a nun and he has a boxing class. Like what could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I said, okay, I'll cool, I'll go check it out. And of course, you know, we had some talks about, um, you know, addiction and, but it was never pointed out that alcohol is a drug, right? So as we say in 12 step recovery on the drug side, it's like alcohol is a drug period. And so I, I went to the guy's class and he was 72 and I, I was 17 and I think I had three days clean at this point and he took a liking to me straight away and I could tell, but of course that's my flirting personality, right? So he says, oh, I want to make you my last prize fighter before I retire. And right, so my initials are KO. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to be a world champion boxer. That's why I pissed off all my scholarships. You know, I'm not meant to be the first female president of the United States. I'm supposed to warn all these young girls like to not do meth. This is great. Like this is, I'm going to be this champion boxer. And yeah, that's my goal. That's my life purpose. And he's like, all right, come, come to my house and we'll watch some tapes because for all of our young viewers and listeners, there's this thing called VHS tapes. You should look it up. It's fascinating. <laughs> We've come a long way. I appreciate your technology, okay? <laughs> I instantly think of the pencil and the, the tapes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Lord. So, and they're I, like, what are those letters again? Exactly. I <laughs> exactly. I don't even know what they stand for. Video? Uh, who knows? <laughs> 
<laughs> we're too old to remember. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can't remember what I was doing five minutes ago. <laughs> right. Speaking of hormones, right? I totally respect that. So I came, I went out to his house and as soon as I got there, like I had something not up in my stomach, you know, cause even in the class I could tell the way he like licked his lips and was, mm. you know, the way he was touching me. Like I, I knew it wasn't right, but I never had a role model in my life, a strong woman or, you know, my dad was a, a, a great man. He had, he liked to party, heavy drinker, worked out of town a lot. You know, I think tried to avoid the house cause my mom was, you know, my mom. So, but I, there was never anybody to, you know, share these tools of assertiveness and, and how to channel your energy properly and, you know, pick up on these red flags. And so getting that validation was great, right? Because that's what I was craving was that attention and validation from other people because I didn't know how to get it for myself because I couldn't stay on the side of my body. And so I ignored the red flags, went out to his house, like it was the one or two days later and as soon as i pulled up again nodding in the stomach i was like this doesn't feel right whatever went knocked on the door he opened the door and he had a cup full of cognac and um he's like hey baby come on in and i was like that's weird i was like okay and went in and he's like come and sit down and sat down on the couch and he put his arm on me on my leg and straight away i was like this is not a good situation but he says here i poured you a drink and again, we didn't have the conversation that alcohol is, you know, it's, it's no different than smoking meth at, at the, at the end of the day. And I thought, right, well, this guy's supposed to be my mentor, right? He knows what's best. And so I took a couple of drinks and he had a blunt. And at that point I'd never smoked weed. So this whole thing about weed being a gateway drug, even though I'm from Humboldt County, California, where it's like the Amsterdam of North America, but I hadn't smoked weed. And I took a few hits off this blunt and he put on a tape and we started watching some fights because we were going to order equipment and he was going to run me through like, you know, visually as opposed to just in class and watching some fights and stuff. And the next thing I know, I woke up and this 72 year old man was inside of me. Oh, mm. yeah. So three days clean, 17 years old. And I was just, what the fuck? And you were a virgin? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got him off of me and... It, it was just like quickly you know, got gathered my stuff and he's like you okay you okay baby and i'm like yeah I, I just i need to go got my car left and he never reached out like and this well, had a pager yeah. never paged me never called my parents house just no word so in my mind i made up the story that was this was my fault i let him on you know i shouldn't have taken the drink shouldn't have hit the blunt and that's that was that and then I even went back and, and trained with him, but I never let him really get close to me. And so I went off to college three months later uh, when you know school started back up and I went off to Sonoma State University and was already like, okay, this isn't Stanford. I'm no idea what I wanna do with my life. You know, I picked criminal justice as a major because I thought, all right, I'm gonna go get all the drug dealers. I, I didn't turn out to be a champion boxer, but I kept holding on to that idea of being KO. And so KO, my initials, I went and got that tattooed on my arm, but then I stepped straight into my mom's shoes and started drinking and developed alcoholism, not knowing that I'm doing the same shit. And so the person that I feared the most, right? Cause she'd, ca she'd crack a King Cobra at seven o'clock in the morning and then she'd switch to Carlo Rossi and it was wine and then it was gin and tonic. And then it was, you know, so the whole typical alcoholic behavior, you know? And um, the hair on the back of my neck would stand up, mm -hmm. right? And you'd think that you would never f do that. It's like the son that watches, I, I always think of Prince, you know, watching his dad you know, beat the shit out of his mom or any child uh, that watches that, generally men, right? That then grow up to do the same thing. It's like what happens to us with our programming that we forget and, yeah. and go straight into that same behavior, right? Again, it's that subconscious that's 40 million times more powerful. It's, mm -hmm. it's wild. It's like an ant riding on the back of an elephant. Mm -hmm. And the ant is your conscious mind saying, let's go to the gym. And the elephant's like, yeah, fuck you. I'm going to in and out You know, <laughs> it's like the elephant's always going to win. So, yep, walked straight into her shoes. And then that kicked off my, my whole alcoholism. And then from there, it's a long story of wrecking five Hondas, 
becoming a drug dealer <laughs> with the sawed off shotgun. I get a low rider moving, doing geographicals up to Oregon, having to flee that state for felony check riding, just doing tweaker stuff, you know, just ridiculous. And I became that person where I'd steal your wallet and then help you look for it, mm. you know? Mm. And that's why it's, I find it so important to talk about this stuff because there's so much stigma still around addicts and alcoholics. And it's like, we have a, a fentanyl epidemic mm -hmm. and, and it is literally killing so many people and we're not doing anything about it. You know, 99% of our conversations right now as a general public, from what I've seen, are talking about trans people, you know, and should trans women be in sports? And it's becoming like this giant argument of, you know, it's the new gay marriage, right? Whether gay marriage is, is correct or not. Mm -hmm. Like looking for something to rally people behind and not address all of these other issues that we have going on, prison reform, right? I mean, you name it, there are so many screwed up faculties and systems in our country, and yet we are purposely, I believe, being led down this path of massive division. So, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but uh, I, 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 it's important for me and I appreciate you giving me this opportunity to share this with with your listeners because you know when we think of addicts a lot we think of like oh it's a matter of willpower and i'm like bitch have you seen my biceps like <laughs> <laughs> right because i always i always stayed in the gym like that was my outlet mm. even though it, it didn't fix my issues i mean it you know became and I'd still go into the gym high. Like I'd smoke meth and then go do cardio. That's a good idea, right? I, I've been there. Yeah. Very, very similar. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I talk about my stories on, you know, when I got out of prison and yeah. eating healthy and the supplements that I was taking. Yeah. You know, I'd be shaking before yep. I'd even get to the gym. And I'm like, this, this is good. Like this is my healthy outlet. Right. And I found that I merely substituted. Yep. Like my obsessive compulsive yep. behaviors are always going to be there. Yep. And I know that there are things that I do that, <laughs> that drive my, my beautiful life crazy. Back at ya. And I'm, you know, I'm very conscious of that. Like I but said, look at those tits. You cannot, <laughs> I'm sorry. You, 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 you'll work on any OCD to right? please I, this queen. I, I, absolutely. <laughs> and it's being conscious of it. Yeah, and, right. and it's having someone that I know that I can trust that's going to give me the feedback that I need. Yep. So I know when I'm a little bit off and, and we have these very candid conversations it's, yep. and it's an ongoing conversation, but getting to that point took me personally many, many years. Right. Um, so I'm really curious to hear like, what was the point? Where do you get to the acknowledgement of when, when things are crazy, yeah, you know, when you're all the way out there, yep. how do you find your base and how do you start bringing it back? It's a really good question because for me, it was so many different times, you know, I would go, so I went to rehab when I was 21 cause I, you know, was sitting next to a meth cook one day and I'm like, this isn't the white house. You know what I mean? Like the penny dropped and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing here? And it, it was a harsh realization by this point I've wrecked a few Hondas and um, five in total by the end of it all. <laughs> this episode has been brought to you by Honda. Holler, <laughs> please pay my friends. We are looking for sponsors. Yeah, safe cars, you know, and motorcycle. Uh, and so, you know, I, I went to rehab, got out, and I heard the message, you know, of the 12 steps and recovery and learning different tools and things, but just wasn't ready. And from there, you know, again, uh, in and out, in and out. And then even at one point, I mean, I, again, towards the end I found, cause I was very functional, right? If I finally kind of got to a point where I was uh, functional, even at my worst, cause then I got back on meth at one point for like three years and that, you know, I, I was very productive. Like I'd increase your property value by like 50, 60 grand. Cause I'd go out, you know, we'd paint and like edge in on the ceilings and retexture the ceilings and up there at three o'clock in the morning, scraping off the popcorn shit and, you know, <laughs> like out pulling out crabgrass by hand at 
two o'clock in the morning with spotlights. We had a bunch of like old neighbors and they were just happy to see us, you know, like sprucing up the place, but they never put two and two together. Like, why are these people out there with a spotlight and cocktails? Wait, that's <laughs> really funny. Cause I thought, I'm like, was she doing real estate at the time? You know, <laughs> I was just tweaked the fuck out. I wasn't one of those tweakers that would like, you know, separate. Uh, screws and nails into little things and then dump them out and it's it's just I would like help you fix your you know taxes and and your credit (laughs) and stuff like that so it made it even more difficult because I was like I'm you know productive but I was again and then you add an alcohol because it was like speed on its own and never wanted to have alcohol and then it was just alcohol and then it was speed and alcohol and that's when you know things get really out of hand and um so yeah, I found the gym, kind of was using that as an outlet and would go in and out of the 12 step recovery rooms a number of times. And I just was not ready. And I like relapse is a big part of my story as it is with a lot of us. And, you know, unfortunately a lot of people don't make it back. And, and I truly, that's believe where I'm at now. If I, I, I don't think I have another relapse in me, you know, and I'll have 13 years clean and sober June uh, 14th this year. So basically in a month. And, um, I, got clean off of meth and drinking because I had four felonies hanging over my head. I was innocent. (laughs) I had to pay a lot of money for a lawyer to prove that. And that's a long story too, but it was enough to be like, okay, this is, this has gone too far. Like this is absurd. It wasn't the five Hondas. (laughs) No, no, not the five Hondas. (laughs) All right. That's the insanity of it too, where people are like, Okay, in one hand, you have your wife, your house, your job, your kids, and in this hand, you have one drink. And you're like, it's going to be different this time. Bitch, you've touched the fire 10,000 times, and every time you've touched it, you burn off your skin, your hand's gone, your wrist's gone, you have a a knob here, and you're like, I bet if I just touch it one more time, it'll be fine. You know, it's like, when are you going to get it? So I... uh, And I want to point out, I don't have emphysema, even though it sounds like it. I don't know. I've had this for like two years now i'm gonna blame it on the vaccine but we won't get too political on this <laughs> podcast so i'll go ahead and park that but just wanted to point that out so then i hurt my back wrestling because at this point i discovered the muscle kink industry so i was selling cars i was an internet sales manager i had a lot of sales jobs throughout my using like i worked for 24-hour fitness i was selling reading programs fuck you name it you know I, I was I, I was in sales and so uh as an internet sales manager I hated it hated my job didn't have purpose and that was I think one of the biggest driving factors bes- aside the body image stuff for the depression is when you don't feel like you don't know what your purpose is mm-hmm. right and I knew I had something to offer but I, I didn't know what it was or what I wanted to do and I think at the time too I had like four thousand dollars in debt on a credit card and that stressed me the fuck out like now I'm like cool just add a few zeros on there <laughs> it's like well that's another lesson you learn it's like credit score you know because it used to be so important and now with the Biden administration it's like you got a better credit score you're paying higher like, what the fuck is that <laughs> anyway again I said I wasn't gonna get political and so uh yeah I hurt my back wrestling because I, I, I actually got on, I was on, this was when we had Craigslist. You remember Craigslist, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And I was looking for, I started doing like, you know, topless modeling and, you know, getting into some of that just to, to support my pill habit. And so I had three months clean and sober off of meth and alcohol, hurt my back, <laughs> wrestling, excuse me, and then went down that path of getting on pain pills because that wasn't my problem right? My problem was alcohol and meth. And it was very functional. It wasn't like, you know, I'd black out because I was always a blackout drinker. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I was I w- would drink at work and then I'd have to go home on my lunch break and smoke meth to sober back up. Like it was that ridiculous. And nobody figured it out. You know, I'm sure people had their suspicions or would smell it, but nobody ever said anything to me because I would be high performing mm-hmm. and I could talk my way out of a paper bag. You know, I could, customers would come in straight away we'd be best friends. I'd build that rapport. And so I, I got away with shit for a long time, you know? And then, uh, I yeah, started taking pain pills. I was on Craigslist and I came across this ad and it said muscular calf video shoot athletes and ballerinas must apply hundred dollars an hour. And I was like, what the fuck is this? I'm going to take a picture of my calves. <laughs> like, okay. And I did. And sure enough, this guy came into my office like two days later on the weekend 
and was kind of explaining to me like, yeah, so it's just this, you know, uh, I take videos of your calves and that's really about it. And I was like, all right, shit, sign me up. So I drove down to Oakland that weekend and was introduced to this whole underground world, which was probably one of the biggest, if not, yeah, the biggest first watershed for me. And that's the only fancy word I know, by the way. <laughs> if y'all don't know what watershed means, it's like turning point, <laughs> aha moment. And um, I was like, what is this? And it's this whole world I discovered of men, because I, I was never approached by women in my um, career doing this, and this was 2008 is when I started. And at first it was just, you know, making these clips with this guy and it'd be flexing. And then I found that there's this webcam and I'm like, oh, I can't do that. My boyfriend will get pissed off. And they're like, no, 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 it's not like that. You flex. And I mean, you could get topless if you wanted to, but you, you know, you don't have to. And I'm like, and they're charging six ninety nine a minute. Like what? This is crazy. So I spent like four months on there and started learning about all these different kinks. Because I guess the difference between a kink and a fetish is a fetish is something like you actually need in order to reach sexual gratification, right? Whereas a kink is just something you're kind of into. And it's primarily for your species. Because we're like, let's have a glass of wine and cuddle and talk about the stars. You know what I mean? <laughs> you guys are like, let me act like a coffee table and put a cigarette out on my <laughs> forehead. That'll really get me off. Like, <laughs> what? what right like <laughs> men and women's brains are programmed uh -huh. so differently you know and i i've learned to appreciate that i believe that's because you know you're you're thank god because if you were all attracted to paris hilton you know we would be a pretty boring world right so you're into all sorts of interesting stuff that us as women w would be mind blown about i had a guy in the kingdom of Bahrain, who I'm still very good friends with today, I've never met, who would send me $400 Western Union to grow out my armpit hair, take pictures of it, sweat in a sports bra, and overnight it back to the kingdom of Bahrain. Wow. And there would be certain areas, like in the Middle East, especially, they're really into lift and carry. So this whole muscle kink industry is things like female strength. They're demonstrations of strength. Some guys mm -hmm. want to see you hulk out of your clothes and like break desks. Some guys want to see me choke men out with my legs. That's how I got started smashing watermelons. That's right. I'm going to teach and, you. And, and <laughs> here's the thing. I definitely, I, I know that we're running up on time here. No way. Oh my gosh. We are. What? And, and it's been quite we're just a, getting to the good part. I know. I mean, like, like how did that happen? happen but part two. Yeah. There's definitely going to have to be a part two because we can, we can go down the whole Hat oh yeah a cliffhanger I, right how did that happen that's so wild well it's so wild you know one of the things that that we really like to focus on is getting to the aspects of your story yeah that not every you know you don't get a chance to talk about these probably as often no everybody knows all of the other stuff what right. they see on tv what they've read in the yeah in the book yeah but we really wanted to know like some of those foundational yeah. events in your life that really have made you into the incredible leader, you. community builder that you are. Yeah. Like the strength that people see in you now. Yeah. It's important they know where it came from. Yeah. And that definitely was like one of the biggest things because it helped me realize that everybody's wearing a mask mm. because that transitioned into then touring around the world. And, you know, I would meet men in hotel rooms and I would tell the front desk, I'm like, look, this is going to look like pretty woman part two but all these men are coming through for me to like beat them up basically not beat them up but you know <laughs> choke them out with my legs and arm wrestle them and pick them up and carry them around you know uh muscle worship like my highest paying session and hopefully no one from the irs is listening to this if you are whatever put me in prison i don't care <laughs> less stress i'm sure of it well no you would say otherwise uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but hey, I'm sure I change a lot of lives in there, you know, 12 step, 12 step, <laughs> right. a lot of people, if it's God's will. And at any rate, um, <laughs> where was I going with that? Well, <laughs> seriously, your highest pain session. Thank you. That's a good friend. Everybody listen. That's a good friend mm -hmm. right there. So highest paying session. But then again, it is a good kind of you're like, how much? It's $3,000 to worship my calf muscles for two hours. No sex. And that's why I used to blog about this stuff because I was so proud of it. I'm like, what? This is insane. I spent my whole life 
wanting to be Kate Moss, hating my body, and it, it didn't mm. make it go away, sure. right? It still took another 10 years for me to walk through that body dysmorphia and that hatred of my body, right? To finally get to, you know, the point where I, you know, launched Girl, created this uh, body acceptance revolution because I think back and I'm like, I was so preoccupied being stuck in self pity and self hatred and poor me that I had no clue what white privilege was. Right. And that even took me six months to unpack. And I thought I was like this super enlightened. I've done all this personal development and emotional intelligence, 12 steps, all this shit. And, you know, being able to realize that even I'm like, yeah. wow, it's, it's wild. So to, you know, learn that everyone's wearing a mask. And cause I'd see federal judges, rock stars, cops, you know, um, FBI agents, people that are uh, pediatric physicians, mm -hmm. you know, and then car mechanics, computer programmers, there was no rhyme or reason. There was no, cause it wasn't like I was a dominatrix, you know, I was a true, powerful, strong woman. And they were truly fascinated by this. And so for them, men to come and be in my presence for an hour and to be on the other side of the coin, to be, you know, not the breadwinner, not the rock, not the dependable one. And to have that permission to let go and be out of control for an hour mm. was like such a release for them, you know, just emotionally, spiritually. And m most of the time it turned into therapy sessions, right? And so that really opened my eyes to the world is not what we think it is. And that's what propelled me to say, I have to get this message out to women and stop women on the street and be like, oh my God, did you know there's some guy out there who would pay you $400 an hour to like just touch your calf muscles? It's absurd, I know, right? Because people would be like, no. I'm like, no, I'm serious. <laughs> no sex. Like, I even started uh, producing a, a docuseries around this last year because it is. I find it so interesting right and that's also where we get into topics of gender roles and you know what direction are we going with humanity at this point and you know are we becoming a genderless society and that concerns me to to a certain degree as well and there's still a lot of stuff to look at and unpack there but as long as we're having productive conversations like adults and not just pissing in each other's weedies like that's what a lot there's a lot of that going on you know and i, I think to to kind of conclude everything is that you know, we, we've got to look at each other as souls having a human experience mm -hmm. and treat each other with respect and kindness and put humanity back into our lives and realize that we're actually a lot more alike than we are different and think open-mindedly and be like, why did we just go through the last three years of what we went through? Because a lot of people truly suffered mentally you know in the isolation and then all of a sudden it's and people lost their business they lost families and you know i was listening to uh and i don't listen to joe rogan this is actually the only joe rogan podcast i listened to but it was he had a doctor on there that testified that 80 percent of the people who had died could have lived had they used the appropriate drugs mm. that were kept off market mm. and you know you, you, you got to start asking questions and being like, w what? Well, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So No, I, I would agree with you. I'd say that yeah. it's still, there's going to be lingering mental health yep. effects from this Yeah, that we don't know how long it's going to last. We don't, it might be generational because yeah. we have a whole um, generation of youth who've been gone through this traumatic period. Right. And it's going to take a couple decades to play out how that impacts them. Yep. But I want to point this out is what you're doing to through your community and we get to be a part of it this summer. Yes, yeah. I'm so excited you you two are coming. Yeah. Truly. Tell us, make sure that everybody knows what this is. What's the event? Yeah, so Girl Live is an extension of Camp Confidence and Camp Confidence was what initially started my the brand Girl. It started out as a program for teenage girls cuz I wanted to teach them everything I wasn't taught in school. Like don't take pictures of your tits and send them to your dirtbag older boy boyfriend so he buys you beer because they might end up on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald like mine did. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> so, yeah, I started this program and, you know, they the, the point was to teach them the tools to discover self-love, which was the five habits, lessons and principles. And then they would see each other as sisters and not competition. Because I'd say, look, we are held back as a gender by our own 
doing, right? And it was remarkable. We had 61 girls come through the program and they were cutting themselves. And mm -hmm. this was back when Snapchat was the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, you fast forward now 12 years and it's like, holy shit, TikTok, you know, just everything that's happened. And, you know, these kids not having access to resilience tools. And that's why I'm so glad you are doing what you're doing to, to share these stories and offer more uh, solutions and resources for people. But the one of my partners got pregnant and in the downtime, my husband said, why don't you turn the same vision and mission into a clothing line and then you can reach because I started noticing the moms needed the message just as much as the, the girls because they would have a yeah. remarkable transformation over this 48 hour period we'll call it. it was a little longer than that make new friends just thriving and then I'd reach back out in a couple of months and things would kind of start to deteriorate and I would kind of start to pick up on uh, your mom <laughs> or your dad you know but the parents had a a, a big role in that sure. and so i thought yeah that makes sense how can we you know expand from a tiny corner of australia and reach a, a global audience and unfortunately is clothing because it's not my jam i think we should all just wear space suits or be naked i don't know i'm not naked because i have a lopsided <laughs> vagina and no one needs, needs to see that <laughs> you know what i mean lopsided tits whatever we're all perfect perfectly imperfect but uh that became girl and that wasn't what i'm not a fashionista so it, it was about the the same thing teaching self-love and acceptance showing real bodies you know bigger bodies as well doing epic shit and being strong and powerful and focusing on combat sports and strength sports and you know and like you said not using sizes and getting away from that stigma and then creating a sisterhood. So if you see another girl in girl clothing, you're like, yeah, we're, you're my sister. Cause on all of our clothing is our, our um, it's called the pledge. And it's, I solemnly swear to the best of my ability to refrain from talking negatively about myself as well as other girls. I am an equal amongst my peers and I do not see myself as neither better than nor less than. Through this pledge of non-judgment, I understand and embrace that I'm having a positive impact on the world and furthering the global revolution of body acceptance. So you take the pledge, you say, and you can say it with someone else, and then you hold each other accountable. Like, stop talking shit about yourself. You took the pledge. Because as you said, right, you two hold each other accountable, and you have conversations. That's what you do. You, you call each other out. Be like, hey, that, that's not how you normally act. What's going on? You know? Or be like, stop saying you're fat. You know, you're not. Like, we have fat. We're not f fat. <laughs> so, uh, and then as, as part of that, I wanted to recreate Camp Confidence and have an event. So, cause I, I, I'm not down with the virtual shit. <laughs> so this um, is, this is live. This it's is in live person, in, Vegas, in Las Vegas, July 15th, 16th weekend. Yes. And we have you two coming as one of our speakers, which I'm so excited to hear your, I've heard yeah. your story, but we're excited. To yeah. Know. I'm super pumped. And we've got, you know, Captain Tavares, who's, um, um, a female captain of Metro police department. Who's got an incredible story where you both you know, have stories of resilience and mm -hmm. perseverance and, and then everything from body art therapy, financial literacy, natural healing with essential oils, mental health and hormones. Um, what else? Self-touch Japanese bondage, which is not available for teenagers, by the way, <laughs> cause I'm, I'm, I'm a stickler with that and all these different athletics to try Olympic lifting, power lifting. So deadlifting in particular golf, um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu for self-defense, um, strongman. And we have uh, booty yoga, not B-O-O-T-Y, it's B-U-T-I. And there's a few more that I'm leaving out. Oh, grief and anger management and financial literacy and a few other workshops. Well, oh. where online? Because that's a lot. Yeah, and, it is a wanna, lot. I don't want to trust it to memory. Yeah. I want to send people there so yeah. that they can start signing up for it now. Yeah, that's great. How do they find it online? So the website will be up next week and it's girllive.com and it's G-triple-R-L. So for the camera, because I'm a visual person. So, or you just go to girl.com and you'll see. <laughs> you'll yes. see. <laughs> yes, Queen. You'll, you'll find the Girl Live tab on girl.com and you'll find tickets to that and it's uh the value is absurd and we want to make it affordable we lose money on this event 
every year but we're like we will figure we'll figure it out at some point you know but we're as a small business and that's a whole nother podcast we could talk about in the future but you know it's like i and guess stay in your lane and stick to clothing but if you don't like that then you can go out and do other stuff and not make money and <laughs> stress about it and fumble your way through but meet amazing people who come and dedicate their time and believe in your cause and i'm super grateful for you we both. are we definitely yeah. we believe in your cause we're all about the community yeah we're happy to be able to not just support it but to actually be a part of it yeah like, really excited about that yeah and anyone listening that believes in this and wants to sponsor because you just said you come out <laughs> negative yeah. please <laughs> yeah we <Don't> <laughs> we got our our yeah. sponsorship deck is it will be done this weekend because yeah we our order's been late for three and a half months and as Ooh. a small business you know and you run month by month and you, you're running in the negative on your cash flow and in apparel if you're thinking about getting an apparel y'all don't do it <laughs> <laughs> i'm just gonna put that out there no. stick to selling salsa or something like that okay. <laughs> noted so, noted sign up we need everyone yes. to sign up come to the event yes we're excited to be there it's coming up shortly Listen, this time has flown by. We're going to have to do this again. We're going to have a follow-up because there's so many other things that we so didn't get a chance to get into. There are. There truly are. There's yeah. a lot more. But listen, this has been great. It's been another incredible episode of Gritability, podcast about the power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds to attain the life of your dreams. So excited, so grateful that you made it in here to spend this time with us in the studio today. Thank you for having me. Courtney, it's been great. Love you both. Ro, you want to take Love us out of too. here? I don't know what to say. I mean, my mind is just going. I had so many questions. But here's how I'm going to leave it, right? The girl, okay, who came into the world breached has the deadliest uh -huh. size yeah. on the planet like it couldn't have happened any other way right right <laughs> okay so that's it we love you guys and we will see you on the next one <laughs>